All right. Let's play. Hmm. Well, let's play Sicilian. Let's play Sicilian. Let's play Sicilian. And let's go back to an accelerated dragon, I think. Let's reinforce some of the concepts that we talked about in the five minute speed run. It's been a while since we played the accelerated, which is the, the gateway Sicilian that I recommend to most people in this rating range who are interested in trying out the Sicilian because it's not too theoretical, it's easy to learn, it features simple to understand development moves, and it can really lead to some really, really good positions if white is not careful. So of course, we fian kettle the bishop, we apply immediate pressure on white center, and okay, c3 is already a mediocre move. c3 is a mediocre move. On the one hand, it's not bad because it reinforces the knight, and it takes some of the power away from the bishop, but on the other hand, it doesn't develop the knight, it takes away the c3 square from white's knight, and white's going to end up developing very, very passively. So how should we proceed with black? What, what should we do? And there's no need to reinvent the wheel here. The moves are very straightforward, which is one of the things that makes this quite, uh, quite appealing. Of course, we go knight f6, and then we castle, and then we go d5. We don't even have to go d6 in most positions. Okay, he blunders a pawn. There's no reason for us not to take this, and already this is bearing fruit. Knight takes c4. And we have, okay, bishop takes c6. That's not great. He's moving his bishop twice, taking it for a knight that, that's only moved once. Now, both three captures make a lot of sense, but I always like to prioritize peace placement and peace activity over pawn structure uh, in most of these instances. So bc would be good in the sense of opening the b file and maybe paving the way for a bishop a6 kind of move. But I still like taking with the d pawn because taking with the d pawn opens a line of line of negotiations between the queen and queen since it's up a pawn that's probably a good idea in addition it opens up our bishop along a more uh juicy diagonal so let's play d takes c6 we also have the two bishops as a sort of as a unit now so opening the center would make sense thank you anti to reborn okay castles we're, we're going to castle as well we don't need to do anything with this knight it's perfectly well placed it's undefended we should be careful about it but there's no way for him to fork it with anything. Everything else is defended. Knight d2. What else? All right. So we can trade knights. There's no reason not to. But if you want to play particularly, you know, in a particularly spicy manner, uh, you, we can also keep the knights on the board because his knight on d2 is a little bit passive. It has no clear prospects. Our knight is in the center. It's it's very you know very jumpy. It's very flexible. It can jump to a lot of good squares. So one move that comes to mind is to bring it back to f6, and then reroute it to either g4 or d5. A lot of people might not consider this move because it's a retreating move, but again, it's a retreating move in name only. We're going to redeploy it on a, either an outpost or or in a very strong g4 square. Uh, and by keeping pieces on the board, we're making it harder for him to, to breathe. All right, knight c4. Uh, now we need to be looking for active moves with our pieces. His knight on c4 feels quite a, quite a bit loose. So, yeah, queen c7 is definitely a good move, aiming at this pawn and preparing knight g4. That's one way to play. That's definitely one way to play. What else comes to mind? What other moves can you guys generate? I just want us to get into the habit of generating reasonable moves in such a position. So bishop e6 wouldn't be great because he can take the bishop and ruin our pawn structure. I see Migar mentioning queen d5. That's the move I had in mind. De uh, deploying the queen into the center and attacking the knight. Um, knight h5, I don't really see the point of that. You're putting the knight on the rim. Knight d5 is a great move. Well, let's play in, you know, Let's play the move that keeps the tension. Let's play queen to c7. I always like putting the queen on this sort of in this envelope because this construction is universal across many openings and it's very good. The pawn on c6 guards against moves like knight b5 or knight d5, and the queen on c7 is very, very safe. Okay, so queen f3. He wants probably to play bishop f4 and attack our queen, which is something that we can try to cut into with what move if we if we use our calculation here we can find a good way to 
not prevent bishop f4 entirely, but take the sting of it. One good move is knight to d5, absolutely. That's a great move, yeah. Centralize the knight, stopping bishop f4. Knight g4 would have also been good. Um, and now we are ready to push our central pawns. An idea that immediately comes to mind here is just to play e5, f5, and e4, right? All right, so he goes rook ID one Should we take the bishop here or not? It wouldn't be a bad idea to take the bishop, but I don't really see the point in that. I like the placement of our knight. I think it's an incredibly strong piece in the center. So the theme of this game is sort of keeping the tension, not trading unless you absolutely have to. And it's time, I think, for us now to start executing the main kingside plan. Well, the knight is strong in the center. It's controlling a lot of squares. It's defended by the pawn. And it's blanketing our position. Now, some of you are attracted to the move h5, which creates the threat of bishop g4. I get it. But you can meet it with h3. h5, h3 doesn't really benefit us because that weakens black's kingside unnecessarily. If he misses the threat, then it would be justified. But I don't necessarily like playing like that. So I think it might be time for us to start executing our main central strategy. By which I mean what yeah so let's start with e5 let's get his knight out of out of d4 and then we can play f5 and perhaps either e4 or f4 just ramming our pawns right down his throat notice that his queen is incredibly vulnerable here it's just it's not very well protected in contrast to our queen which is hard to get to and his pieces in general are like bowling kegs you know, you're just rolling you know you're rolling the bowling ball down um his pieces just are they aren't anchored they aren't very well anchored so we keep pushing them away with our pawns our pieces are very well anchored either because they're so far away or in the case of our knight because they're well protected by a pawn knight b5 we would take it knight b5 we would take it and attack his other knight so i get the point but yeah so bishop c5 all right that's a good move and we need to move our rook where should we move it So rook e8 or rook d8? A lot of you are saying e8, but if you think about where this bishop might wants to go, I would put the rook on d8 to take the sting out of bishop d6. Right, because then we would play rook takes d6 and get two pieces for a rook. So you have to always ask yourself, well, where are his pieces going? Rather than identifying the immediate threat, which is important, you also need to, and another way of thinking about this is that the rook is just more, uh, more active on on a semi on an open file than it is on e8. We, the pawn on e5 doesn't need any more defense, um, because it's going to go to e4. But you know the d file does need more protection. I'll talk about that uh, line in the, after the game. He did have c4 in the end of that line, uh, and that led to some interesting complications. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll talk about that. Okay, so. Queen to g3, offering a, a queen trade, which, once again, we can totally consider accepting. There would be nothing wrong with that. But we've agreed to keep the tension when possible and play aggressively when possible. So what comes to mind? This is a move which I wouldn't necessarily make in one of my own games. It's quite risky. But let's see what happens. F4. F4 covering the attack this does weaken our e4 pawn but if we consider the immediate the immediate uh you know changes in the position you know what has changed what what can we now do as a result of this move you look around the board and you say aha well this bishop on c8 now has the square uh left behind by the pawn and incidentally this also defends defends f5 we should keep an eye on his queen it's almost out of squares the problem is bishop f6. Perhaps some of you are attracted by this move. It would enable queen h6. Um, so let's not rush. Let's go bishop f5 first. But let's keep an eye on his queen because we might be able to spring some sort of a trap on his queen if he's not careful. All right. Knight d4. This guy is good. This guy is very, very good. Now, is he threatening anything? No, he's not threatening anything. Knight f5, g f5 is perfectly fine for us. However, it might not be a bad idea for us to bring some beef onto the king side just in case. So how should we 
what should we do here? What comes to mind at such a position? So queen f7 is a good move, but the problem there is that he got, he goes knight to d6. He goes knight to d6, and that's just a nasty move that I don't necessarily want to deal with. So I missed that initially, which is why I misled you guys. Um, let me think for a second. This is not an easy position. What I like to, you know, one way to think about this is that the general problem that we are facing as black is that his pieces are are encroaching on our territory a little bit too much. So if we can just push his pieces away, it's going to make it a bit easier for us to maneuver around. So let's start with the move b6. Let's get the bishop out of c5. And perhaps we'll get one of these knights out of its central post. And that'll make it slightly easier for us to, uh, to survive. Now, the, there's a downside to this, which is that this pawn on c6 has lost the support of the other pawn. Now the queen is a little tied up, but I think we'll be able to deal with that successfully. Our position is active enough. Okay, so here, if we take the bishop, then we allow him to take our bishop. I don't want to allow that. Let's play gf. This is a very nice pawn box because we've got a pawn chain here. The king is a little weakened, but nothing we can deal with. It's, it's not that bad. He doesn't have too many pieces on the king side. We can always bring the king away to h8. This is a great example of something that would worry a lot of players. They would look at this king and say, oh, this king is really weak. But he doesn't even really have a rook lift, right? Our pawns are covering all the squares on the third rank. So you have to be super concrete. Okay, so I, but I, I do think that this is a great time uh, for us to make sure that our king doesn't, uh, you know, doesn't get caught in the crossfire. So let's, let's bring our king to h8. Now we're not worried about this pin because the bishop trade is going to happen imminently. And another thing I want you guys to notice, another thing that is often missed when you visually sort of notice that the king might be, might look weak, it's the fact that the half open g file, it may favor white, but it also may favor black because we can put a rook on g8 and start targeting his f pawn. And that's not something that white can do to us, right? But uh, at the same time, yeah, the guy is playing really, really well, really well. Queen g5 is a brilliant move. Okay, so let me see. He's attacking this pawn. I think we should defend it. Let's go rook f8. Yeah, rook f8 to defend the f5 pawn. And the best option for him would be, I don't think he's going to see this, but to trade everything and then go knight to e5 at the end exploiting the weak c6 pawn that would potentially win potentially win back the pawn but that's a very advanced idea very advanced idea so let's see he does take and whoop blunders the queen <laughs> knight d6 is a bit of an odd move that's a gm idea for sure I, I i don't like it when we immediately jump to conclusions guys if this guy makes a couple of good moves that doesn't mean anything he might be underrated you know, we we always should should give the people the benefit of the doubt. Okay, let's go F three, target the pawn, creating the uh, creating the laying the groundwork for a lobster pincer mate. So what should we do now? How do we orchestrate the lobster pincer mate? Just what is the most clinical way of doing it? And this you often kind of see this when you keep the tension. It's it's like eventually, yeah. So between these two moves. I know that it doesn't matter when we're up a queen, but when you're not up a queen, it's uh, it's a good idea to play queen g4 because if you play queen h5, then he plays h4 and we have to waste another move. Queen h3, and now if you've done your puzzles, you'll know what the pattern is here. He stops the lobster pincer mate, but, but uh, in doing so, he locks his king up and now there is a very typical idea and a very pretty idea to go rook f6 and either to lift the rook up to h6 and give checkmate or as I'm sure you guys are very well aware, we begin with a what? We begin with a queen sack and then end the game with rook h6 checkmate. It's nice, it's common, it's typical. The rook on g1 is the instrument of his demise, right? It blocks the king from escaping. It's nice, that's a good, uh, it's, it's a good tool in your toolkit because sometimes you don't have time to complete the rook lift, this saves the tempo because it comes with check. Okay, that was a nice game by our opponent for sure. 
So the opening went very well for us. He he won c3, which is subpar, and then bishop b5 is very bad. The way to play for white here is to go knight to d2 and at least defend the pawn. And then we castle, you know, generally speaking, people bring the bishop out, and then you go d5 in one fell swoop. Black's got a great position here. We've had this type of position in the five-minute speed run a million times. And... Um, you know, this kind of stuff is easy to play, good development, etc., etc. Um, so bishop b5, he blunders the pawn. And again, this is a decision which, you know, can be made either way. You can play bc to, to get more, you know, beef in the center. That's probably the better move, honestly. dc is the move which is easier to play because you're opening up the bishop, you're opening up the center, uh, and we're already up a pawn. It doesn't matter too much. Okay, so castles, castles, knight d2. And we decided to keep the tension here. Knight back to f6. This knight, potentially rerouting. Knight to c4, we decided on queen to c7. Aiming at h2 and paving the way for knight g4. Once again, there were other moves here. Queen to d5 would be a fantastic move to uh, attack the knight. And generally, I'm not a big advocate of you know, moving your queen into traffic like this. But in this particular instance, uh, it, the knight on c4, it's hard to defend this knight. And the queen is quite inv invulnerable on d5. It can't be attacked easily. So this is almost an ex a exception to the rule. Instead, we go queen c7. Queen f3 is a good move. Queen f3 is a very good move. Um, and knight to d5 is fine. You know, knight g4 was also possible. Knight d5, okay, to d1. Why not b5? Because b5 is a good idea, but it weakens the c6 pawn. We ran up against this in the game. He would go knight e5, and all of a sudden, this pawn on c6 is incredibly weak, and if you push that pawn, well, then you drop the pawn on b5. You've got to be very careful about these kinds of drastic pawn movements, because they usually leave behind weaknesses. Knight d5. Okay, so now we start pushing our central pawns. e5, f5. Now we go rook to d8, and again, rook to e8 would have allowed him either to go bishop d6 or even more unpleasantly, knight d6. Not the end of the world, and in, in the context of the specific lines, maybe this would have been even better for black than what we did. But my idea was to defend the d6. So now we could have played e4. Yep, e4 was very much possible, attacking the queen. 100% possible. Uh, and probably even better than what we did. I, I honestly forgot about e4. I forgot about e4. I forgot that this just counterattacks the queen. Now he would have moved his queen back and we would have had the same issue. Right here, you would have again had to decide where to put, you would have had to move the rook eventually, uh, but e4 would have been a, a great addition, a uh, great intermediate move. What about rook f7? That's also possible, but again, it, it, it runs into knight d6 and stuff, so. Um, Impossible. Yeah, it's impossible to anticipate. I mean, I couldn't anticipate that, that that would have to happen later. Now, some of you with very sharp tactical vision indicated that bishop d6, which is seemingly refuted by this line, is very much possible because of c4. I saw this move and intended e4 in this position attacking the queen. And there was a detail that I anticipated here, because if the queen goes back to e2... Black to play and make this line work. What does black do here? I'll show you guys a very nice um, example of this kind of, of this kind of play. Knight f4. See, when your queen is pinned, it's very important to understand that the knight is literally not literally paralyzed. It can still move, and counterattacking your opponent's queen can be a very valuable tool in such situations to get out of the pin. However, the queen can move to h3. If it moves to g3, great. We trade queens and the knight is free to go. But if it goes to h3, this is the detail that I missed. Knight f4 is no longer effective because the queen is defended by a pawn. White's going to end up winning a piece. Black can play f4, though. And I think that there must... Oh, there is a way to get out of this situation. Yes. Black to play. Now, we can't move the knight to attack the queen, but we can do something very similar. We have to understand that the queen on h4 is still undefended. So we use the queen to get out of the pin. Queen f6, typical technique. And if he trades, then we take with a knight, and our knight is, is 
is fine. He can give us a check, but it's not dangerous. We'll, we'll get out of this situation. So you're able to see the various tools of getting out of the pan. If bishop f6, he goes queen h6, and uh, we can't trap the queen. You see what I'm saying, guys? You can, you'd have to repeat moves here and then go queen f6, or, or even queen e7 also does the same thing. Uh, I hope this makes sense. Okay. So I have a similar game for you guys afterwards. So e4. Now, in one of my games, I would have traded queens, but here we decided to go f4 and bishop f5. Pin your light squared bishop to your other rook. Yeah, it does. So in terms of how we would have gotten out of this scenario, there is a there, there are two main ways to do it. The first is to try to get this rook away from d8, which could be hard to do because he could double. But the, the main idea is to go b6 and bishop b7. Right, so let's let's make a couple random moves. Let's say b6, whatever, bishop b7. He's got some tactics here with rook d7, but as a general concept, this is the way to get out of a pin like this. Uh, but here we could go king e7 and then try to intercept the rooks and try to get the rook away from d8. So it's a little bit more complicated than I had intended, but we would have been able to get out of it. So rook e1, e4, f4, bishop f5. Knight d4 is very nice. And... I didn't anticipate, I'll be honest with you guys, I didn't anticipate that it would be kind of hard for black to, to unfreeze the pieces. This d6 square is a problem. That square is a problem because if we move the queen to f7 to beef up the security, yeah, the knight slides into d6 and b7 might hang. And, you know, things just start getting really flimsy here. That pawn on e4 is weak. Uh, so I underestimated this, and that's why we went b6, just trying to push his pieces away a little bit. I think he should have gone bishop a3. I think if he had gone bishop a3, he would have kept the tension on our position. Um, although here we would have gone c5, shutting down the bishop and forcing it to bite on granite. And I think this would have given us a really nice position. So maybe not. Maybe this was correct. Okay, so king h8, sliding the king away. Another nice move, queen g5, targeting where, you know, hitting where it hurts. We have to defend the pawn. Not now, just at the moment when he was about to recover, he blunders his queen. Now, what should he have done? Takes. And now the moment the b6 is played, as I noticed to you guys, the c6 pawn becomes weak. That, that's a mental note that you have to make. The more such observations you make, the likelier it is that you're going to come up with the right decision later on. So in this position, knight to e5 is super unpleasant. If the pawn was on b7 here, uh, that would not be a problem. But pawns don't go backwards. And even if you defend the pawn he can still take on c6, undermining the knight on d5, right? So what can black do in this position? Well, we can try to go knight e7, but then the rook slides into d7. And if the king goes up to f6, who can spot a very pretty tactic for white in this position? Well, I hope it's because people are captivated and not half asleep. <laughs> Yeah, knight c6, rook d6 is a typical motif. And, you know, I think black is still better here. I think this is how we would have played, because black's rook now gets to d2. And these pawns, man, these are dangerous pawns. You can advance this pawn at e3 and get a passer. Black is still better here, but white gets good drawing chances in the end game. But instead, of course, he made knight d6, I don't know, hallucinated. Maybe he thought he was going to give a fork on f7. Forgot about the rook there. Whatever it was, the tension pays off in our favor, and, and, and we won the game. So, both captivated, but still trying to sleep. No, you should definitely sleep. But struggling to spot these tactics in the actual game, what are your advice on improving these? Well, that's where puzzles come in. There's no shortcut, there's no cheat code toward building pattern recognition other than to solve thousands of puzzles. And you also have to be mindful when you're solving puzzles you know, and also ex game experience. You know, when you play a lot of games and then you analyze those games, the engine will tell you the moments at which you missed various tactics. And you might say, oh, well, I saw this in a puzzle and I missed that in one of my games. You know, what could I have noticed in the position to allow me to see something like this? Over the board games, in my case, you know, represented a large part of my experience. So I can think off the top of my head of just such an example. Like you see this tactic with knight c6, rook d6, right? Let's take a game that I played in 2005. 
um, where I remember having a very similar kind of tactic. And since then, that tactic has been kind of ingrained in my, in my mind. So let me give you guys a good example. So, okay. This is from a game in 2005. I was 1800. And I've got sort of a good knight against bad bishop. I advanced my king. My opponent, who's 1800 as well, brings his king to e2. Kind of an inoffensive move. Normal, you know, he didn't smile when he played this move. Black to play. Black to play. Yeah, knight takes b2. Knight takes b2, rook c2. Similar type of concept with a winning rook endgame up a pawn, and then this pawn is going to be toast as well. Thank you, Mr. Swaggy. And so since then, I've kind of remembered this tactic and filed it away in my mind. You've got to try to do the same thing. Whether or not you see a tactic in your game, try to file things away in your mental library. Oh, this is this kind of tactic. This is what I, I need to look for in this position, etc., etc. Okay. All right. I have one more game to reinforce an idea. Now, just to, uh, to dial it back to this situation where you bring your knight away from the, the queen pin, and I hope these games help you guys build your mental libraries too. I'm not trying to flex all the time. I'm trying to give people various various ways to uh, you know to to put things in your memory. Okay, so I have a good example of of this kind of tactic, which one of my opponents had missed. All right, all right, so. Let's now take a look at a game slightly more complicated from 2013. This was the last tournament. This was the tournament after I became a GM. So it's round two. I'm playing at this tournament in Spain. I'm playing a 2100. And in this position, it's a King's Indian. I decided on the move knight to d3. It's kind of a cool tactical idea. Now, if my opponent takes it. He takes d3. Now, what's the idea? If rook takes d3, who can spot... The refutation. What's the point? The point is to play bishop e4, pinning the rook to the queen. That's quite elementary. And if queen takes d3, which my opponent played, then you notice that the queen and the knight are in the same file. Of course, I played c5 and my opponent, uh, you know, he lost shortly thereafter. But as soon as I played c5, I, I realized that I had missed something quite nasty. And my opponent plays the correct first move, but misses the point. My opponent plays what move here? So knight c6 immediately doesn't work. I simply take. You guys are seeing an element of the right idea. Perhaps some of you are seeing this move. But the funny thing is you go from the frying pan into the fire. You're still going to be pinned. You're not going to be able to take the rook. But you're overthinking it. The move knight c6 is not necessary. The same thing goes for this move. G takes f5. You lose the knight. So the preliminary move is what? The move c5 relinquishes control over the d6 square. First you play bishop to d6, which he did. Rook takes d6. And my opponent played knight takes d6 instantly, which is very bad. Because after queen takes d6, I have two pieces for a rook. A knight dropped back. Takes, takes. And what move finished the game? This is what I had calculated. The line went exactly as I planned. Boom, boom, bishop a6 resigns. And even without this move, black would be winning, but this wins a piece. But in this position, I was holding my breath because I spotted a pretty nasty tactic that would have complicated the game tremendously. White to play, who can find the move? Let's flip the board. It's not knight takes d6, but it's a pretty incredible move. And it's the move knight to f5. Knight to f5, knight to c6, rook takes c6. Knight to f5 is a nasty move. Why? Because first of all, if rook takes queen, knight takes queen is check. That's what's so crucial about this move. White keeps both of his knights alive, and white is up in exchange. So you might look at this and say, well, that's no problem, right? I can just play g Oops, I can just play g takes f5. But now after knight takes d6, black still has two pieces for a rook. But look at how much this pawn structure has been ruined. The knight's going to capture this pawn at f5 on the next move. And the position is approximately equal. 
right? Black's king side is ruined, white's pieces are active, and white climbs out of the uh, climbs out of the hole and survives. So this idea of moving a knight that's pinned to the queen can be a very valuable tactic to put into your arsenal of ideas. I miscalculated. Yeah, so bishop e4 is, is, is what I would have played. Even here knight f5 is possible, but, um, but, but just moving the queen is also good because then you're going to uh, pry the bishop away with f3. It's, it's very complicated. Um, so I did miscalculate here, and at the moment I played knight d3, I saw the idea of knight f5. But my opponent, who was very high rated, you know, he's a good player, but he automatically took on d6 because the mental association is that you can't move a knight on d4. Mental library now augmented. But I think when you see these games and stuff, you know, some things may stick, some things may not, but uh, hopefully some things do stick. Another thing I want to make clear, I saw this sort of feedback on Reddit, and I think it's very well-intentioned feedback. Don't watch this and then say, okay, now I'm going to play a couple games and I'm going to expect to win every single game. And if I don't, then that means I didn't learn anything. You never, you know, things take a while to settle in. And, you know, and, and, and you have to give yourself a chance. You also have to allow yourself to make the same kinds of mistakes you've been making. You're not going to automatically start playing like a GM. So I think it's important to moderate your expectations. All right. 